and a congregation. But um, we got to talk a minute because um, Tessa said that you, the Lord put on your heart that Joan should be able to teach here on a Shabbat. And Esther said that women ought not to teach. And so we have a little bit of a controversy here. Because the Bible says women ought not to teach. The word teach in the Hebrew is to be a rabbi. In other words, the Bible doesn't speak that women should not speak in a congregation because, as you know, most women do speak in this congregation. In Orthodox Jewish congregations, women cannot even sit with men. Do we believe that? Do we practice that? No. No. Uh, Women are not allowed to carry the Torah in Orthodox congregations. Do we practice that here? Women are allowed to carry the Torah. And women are allowed to give their testimony. And it says that women shall prophesy. In other words, we have the same Holy Spirit. What the Bible is addressing is that a woman should not lead a congregation. A woman should not be a leader of a congregation. In other words, do not call a woman rabbi or pastors. Because think about if the woman is married and she's leading the congregation and her husband's sitting there, who's leading? They're out of order. That's what the Bible is, is referring to. Not that women should be quiet and not speak. Not that women shouldn't say anything. Because we violate that every Shabbat. So in other words, what is God meaning by women should not teach? Women should not be rabbis. Women should not lead a congregation. And there are congregations today that women are rabbis, women are pastors, and they do lead congregations. That's what the Bible is addressing. That's what the Holy Spirit put on my heart, that he does, not, he does not prefer for a woman to lead a congregation. As far as women speaking and women allowed to speak and that kind of stuff, women have been oppressed for a long time with the, those scriptures, and it ought not to be so. Women love Yeshua. As a matter of fact, Orthodox men do not even touch women. An Orthodox rabbi will not even shake hands with a woman. In other words, won't even touch them. Did, did Yeshua allow women to touch him? Were they some of his biggest supporters? And let me share with you, some of the biggest supporters of Mishkan have been women. And so this congregation honors women. Women are allowed to speak. And you can teach the Torah during the week. Now, if you became a rabbi, then I would disagree with you. If you led your own congregation... I would disagree with I would not join that congregation. Let's put it that way. <laughs> women should not be leaders of congregations. But as far as women speaking, as far as women praying, as far as women prophesying, we have the same Holy Spirit. Amen. There's no male or female. We all have the same Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's not use those scriptures to oppress women, Amen. as has been done for centuries. Let's not use those scriptures like that. Amen? Does that, mean, does that bear witness in your spirit? I'm getting the Holy Spirit rush as I'm, as I'm saying it. So the only thing that we disagree on is a woman leading a congregation. That's what we disagree with. And I think that makes sense. Amen? And, uh, and of course, women loved Yeshua. I mean, I mean, and as I said, some of the biggest supporters of his ministry were women. And so praise God. Praise God for women. Praise God for for moms. Praise praise God for wives that are submitted to the Lord. I mean, praise God for every one of these things. And those scriptures will not be used to to suppress women in this congregation. Praise God. We're allowed to sit together. We're allowed to pray together. We're allowed to discuss scripture together. Amen. And, 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 And spiritually, women are equal. They have the same Holy Spirit. Can we say amen to that? Do they have the same? If you're born again, do you you have the same Holy Spirit? And we can be one spirit in this congregation. And we can have that love going on here. So praise God. So anyway, that's that's, as far as, as the Holy Spirit's put on my heart, that's the stand of the Mishkan. In case anybody was questioning or answer, you know, or wondering, that is what that is what the Holy Spirit has put in our heart. Amen? Amen? You can give the Lord a big hand. If you agree with that. Anyway, Esther called me off by surprise with this Shabbat Zakor. Um, But, and it's beautiful to remember the enemy. We remembered him last night. We booed him all night. Uh, 
As a matter of fact, some people say that even Adolf Hitler was a descendant of Haman. Even if he wasn't a physical de de um, descendant, it is that evil spirit, that, that murdering spirit and that hate of Jewish people that's been around. It was in, it was in, it was in the Romans who, who destroyed Jerusalem. It's in Islam today, the hate for Jewish people. It, it, is, a, it is a wicked spirit. It is a murdering spirit. And, it's, and behind it is, of course, the devil. He hates Israel. He makes war with Israel. He makes war with the children of God. He hates the God of Israel. He hates Israel, and he hates the Israel of God. Everyone who, is, who has joined the Lord and are, and are walking with the Lord, he hates you if you love the God of Israel. He hates us, and he wants to murder each and every one of us. And make no mistake, he, is, he, is, he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy, just like, just like it says. And, and, and the way he uses is, is, is through separation. He wants us separated from God. Because when we're one with God, we, we're made perfect, the Bible says. John 17, the Lord prayed for us, and he said that they may be one as we are one, as the Son and the Father were one. That they may be one like us, so that they may be made perfect. Our perfection is not just performance and doing things for the Lord. Our perfection is being in God. And that's what the that's what the devil's always after. He always well, he, he's not anti-religion, he's anti-Christ. Anti-Christ, Christ means anointed. He's anti-anointing. How I many you know you can have the Holy Spirit inside of you and barely make contact with you know with the presence of God? And the adversary is always after our contact with him. And the reason I bring this up is as we read, as we start reading in the book of Leviticus. There is, there, there is a complex system in place by God regarding sin. And, it's, and God makes this whole complication thing that every time somebody sins, they have to bring a, a, an unblemished animal and sacrifice, and he must be bled, and the blood on the altar will make an atonement for that person's soul. And so God sets up this whole sacrificial system. Now, I've heard a lot of brothers and sisters say, oh, God did away with the sacrificial system. We no longer need that. I beg to differ. Because if you're a true worshiper of God and you do sin, anyone here a worshiper of God? And you don't sin anymore, right? You stop sinning. The moment the Holy Spirit touches you, you stop sinning. Oh, occasionally you fall into sin. We fall into sin, correct? And God has dealt with the sin issue. He dealt with it in a certain way under the Old Testament. It took me a while to understand, you know, why did Yeshua have to die? Why did he lay his life down? Why is he our sacrifice? And this is only understood when you begin to worship God. Because when you begin to worship God, there's someone who is anti-worship. There's someone who wants to stop you from worshiping God. There's someone who wants to stop you from connection with God. Because as I said earlier, the Lord said it very specifically when he prayed for us, Father, that they may be one in us as we are one, that they may be made perfect in oneness. In other words, our worship of God, our contact with God, our attachment to God is what changes lives is what changes you and I from the inside out. It's not performance. Because if it was based on performance, God didn't have to make a new covenant. God already gave us the commandments. And the Bible says they couldn't keep them. And so God sent his son to do them for us so we don't have to keep anymore either. I mean, that's, that's what's preached today in many churches today. That because he accomplished what we could not accomplish... Therefore, we don't even have to try. And people have been told, don't even try. Can't do it. How many people have heard that? Don't even try to keep his instructions. That is the furthest thing from the truth. And the only one that's behind that is the adversary who wants to, who's the spirit of disobedience. His only claim to fame, in case you didn't know how he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, is he wants to make sure we disobey God. Because even though God forgives us, and we're under grace. You could be under grace the enti your entire life and not be blessed. 
I, was, I continued in my sin. I continued in the way that I always was. And I now had Yeshua. I had Jesus. So therefore, I was taught when I first came into the kingdom of God that he did everything. I didn't have to do anything. And so I kept going the same way I was. I'd worship God. I'd attend services. I'd read my Bible. I'd pray. But I wasn't going anywhere in the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, I was going backwards. And I started to question. And I started to read certain scriptures. Like the Lord said, I didn't come to destroy the law of the prophets. I've come to fulfill. And then I would read further. And he said, if you teach, if you break the least of these commandments and you teach people that, you'll be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And I was like, I was like, this doesn't make sense. This is not what I'm hearing. I'm hearing something else come from pulpits that is, doesn't line up with what he said. And I didn't understand what he was talking about. Because first of all, most of Christianity has thrown out the commandments of God. And, and now it's fulfilled in Jesus, and therefore I don't have to do anything. How many, pe how many people have heard that? The difference is that if we can figure out how he fulfilled the law, then we could fulfill the law, and we wouldn't be running into the sin problem all the time which is what they ran into under the Old Covenant. They ran into a sin problem. Did they pay a huge price for their transgressions? Did the Jewish people pay a huge price? They received the commandments of God. They said we're going to keep them, and then they didn't do it. How's it gone for the Jewish people? Not very well. And then most of them today say, can't be done. Most Jewish people are not Torah observant, do not observe the law of God, because in their minds it's difficult. And the way they teach it is difficult. Because the Lord said, they sit in Moses' seat, they bind heavy burdens on men's shoulders. In other words, they've taken the commandments of God under the old covenant, the Jewish people of today, my people, and have made it difficult. Nine out of ten Jews do not keep the Torah. I was one of them, I know. And then when I came in and became a believer in Yeshua and Jesus, and I was told I don't have to do anything, it was perfectly natural. I never did anything. Perfect doctrine for me. It was like duck to water. I was like, hey, I like this. He did what I never did, and I don't even have to try. I like this Christianity business. Can I still be Jewish? Yeah, you can still be Jewish. Is he, was he Jewish? Yeah, he was Jewish. Um, is it all right if we worship on Shabbat instead of Sunday? I'm not used to the Sunday business. Yeah, it's all right. You can still be Jewish. We can do keep Shabbat. And it's like, but you want to know something? Shabbat and circumcision was before the law of Moses, by the way. Yeah. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah. In other words, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had the Shabbat before the law of Moses and had circumcision. Abraham's sons, Abraham himself was circumcised at 90 something years old. I don't recommend that, by the way. Bad enough you're old. Can you imagine God telling you when you're 90-something, time to get circumcised? And you're like... <laughs> That's when you stop being a believer. That's when you say, Satan, get thee behind me. But anyway, circumcision on the eighth day for male descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was a requirement. And so was the Sabbath. And, uh, and so, as far as keeping the Sabbath and being circumcised, as a Jewish person, most of us do have that. That most of us honor the Sabbath or know the day of worship is the Shabbat, as a Jewish person. Even as a non-observant Jewish person, I knew Shabbat is Shabbat, and I knew circumcision, because that's what we were trained in before the Law of Moses. When the Law of Moses was given... That's when sin entered into the world because God told them to do certain things. And he told them through Moses. And they stood before Moses and the Lord and the mountain when the commandments were given and they said, we will do it. And of course, they didn't. And so God set up a sacrificial system that he, that they, he had to deal with them when they transgressed his commandments. And it took me a while to understand, like, why is this sacrificial system? Why did Yeshua have to die? What is this blood business? I mean, it, it, it just did, it, it didn't, it didn't register. 
until, until one day I'm reading Scripture, and you know the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He leads us into all truth. Anyone experience that when you read Scripture? Something you don't understand for a long time, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will, 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 will step in and give you the information or give you the answer. How I many you know He doesn't forget any questions that we have? It could be years later you get the answer. And he'll remind you that you asked him years ago. And now he gives you the answer because he couldn't give it to you right away. You wouldn't understand. Or I would not have understood. But I began to understand and I became a worshiper of God. Because as a worshiper of God, I still fell into sin. I, I, God began to transform us. It says that we be conformed to the image of his son. That means we were deformed. And I started out the form. Like I tell people, the day you and I were raised to sit in heavenly places, we were dead in our trespasses. You, you could not have been more of a sinner the day you got born again. You were at your worst condition. So now that you're walking with God and you now are learning about God and you're doing a little bit better, you're still going to sin. I mean, come on. Let's, can we get real? And so now here comes the adversary who is known as the accuser of the brethren. Now, it took me a while to understand why does he accuse? What is, what, what is accomplished by accusing? And not only does the adversary accuse us, we accuse each other. When you accuse someone of their sin, because you're sinless, right? Can you imagine somebody who sins accusing somebody else who sins? That's like the pot calling the kettle black. I mean, it's ridiculous. I enjoyed, Sash, thank you for sharing that you've become friends with us and you, we haven't judged you. Amen. We don't judge you. Because it's, be, it's between you and the Lord. Yes. And you're the best that you've ever been in your life since you've started walking with the Lord. Amen. Are you perfect yet? No. no. Is anyone here perfect yet? No. In other words, we're being perfected. Yes. And the devil knows that. And how are we being perfected? By the presence of God. By our, our, our proximity to God. Because, I mean, being born again means that God has literally moved inside of you through the person of the Holy Spirit. And now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God is as close as our breath now. Imagine. You don't think the devil knows that? And we have now access to God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You don't think the devil knows that? You know how he knows that? He has no access. He was kicked out of heaven. So he has zero access to God. We have 100% access to God by the sacrifice of Yeshua, by his blood. We now, have, we now have access to God, our Father who is in heaven, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He doesn't sleep. If you wake up in the middle of the night, is he there? Can you talk to him? Can you enter into his courts? Can you approach the throne of grace, especially in your time of need? And the adversary is right there, always running interference. Every time we pray, every time we read our Bible, every time we attend services, every holy day we keep, Every time, in case you haven't noticed, because I've noticed this over the years, that every time I try to make contact with God in any way, shape, or form, the adversary's right there. So how many people have noticed that? He's the anti. He wants to break up our relationship with God. Because his relationship with God is broken. He's cut off. And you don't think he knows what it is to be cut off? He knows very well what that means to be cut off. The Bible says he will eat dust all the days of his life. Do you know what that means? He has no access to angel food. Eating dust means eating death. Every, he experiences death every single day. We now experience life. And he knows where that life comes from because he was in that light. He was in that life. He knows exactly how things work. And he knows exactly how to get to us. And he uses accusations. Not only do they come directly from him and his minions and his demons, straight into your spirit, they come from other people, including your brothers and sisters in the Lord. 
In case you haven't been accused by brothers and sisters, you just started. <laughs> and I find it amusing because I remember the Lord when they found this woman. She was caught in adultery. They were ready to stone her, remember? Most of us are ready to pick up rocks all the time, by the way, and start throwing them. And you know what the Lord said? He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Now, does that mean we shouldn't hold ourselves accountable one to each other? We should encourage each other to sin? That's not what the Bible teaches. We're to exhort one another to love and good works. But notice what it says, if a brother is overcaught in a fault, you who are more spiritual, most people consider themselves very spiritual. Somebody say amen. amen. So I'm not lonely up here. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to myself. Uh, Galatians 6, verse 1. In other words, don't be so quick to point out your brother or sister's faults that are obvious to you. Because, you know, especially when you make friends with someone. When you make friends with someone, they tell you personal things about their life. And not every brother and sister is mature enough to not use those things against you in a court of law. That's why when you get arrested by the police, they say everything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. In other words, you can't always tell everybody everything. Because not every brother and every sister is going to encourage you. Some are going to try to tear you down. In case that hasn't happened to you already. And they're doing the works of the adversary. Because when somebody tries to tear you down, what are they trying to do? They're trying to pull you away from God. They're trying to make you feel guilt. They're trying to make you feel shame. And what happens when you feel guilt and shame? What did Adam and Eve do? They hid from the presence of God. In other words, the adversary wants to make sure that you and I run away from God. Even though he doesn't run away from us. Because some people say, oh, the Lord left me. Or the Lord doesn't love me anymore. Baloney. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So when you feel empty, it's not because he left. It's because you left. And what causes people to leave the presence of God? Sh guilt. Shame. Focused on their sin. Because that's what the devil wants. He wants you to focus on your error. And the old covenant was sin conscious. That's what the Bible says. In other words, there was constant sacrifice of sin. In other words, the last sacrifice, the goat or the sheep or the cattle that you brought, or the dove, or the offering that you brought was for that specific sin. But if you sinned again, you had to show up with another animal. In other words, there must have been a bloody mess there in Israel. I mean, everyone bringing their, their, their sacrifices constantly because of their sin. I mean, it, it, and so they were always thinking about, focused on, on what was wrong, and focused on what they, and, and, and their error. And I've noticed in my walk with the Lord, when you focus on your sin, you will not overcome sin. We don't overcome, we don't overcome error or sin focused on the sin. And so, and so the reason I'm bringing this up is because we should not be used in the body of the Messiah and our brothers and sisters. We should not allow the adversary to use us to accuse our brothers and sisters. Even though it's legitimate... You've told me something about you, or I heard something about you, and it's accurate. I don't need to use it against you. Because I am not sinless myself. And he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. In other words, I don't want to do the works of the adversary. I want to work for the Lord and him only. Amen? Amen. And he did not come to condemn the world. He came to save. And we should be of that same spirit. We're here to help you. We're not here to hurt you. We're not here to tear you down. And tearing somebody down doesn't help, by the way. No matter how much you think you're helping that person, tearing somebody down makes them leave and say, I don't need to be in a place where I'm torn down or I'm criticized 
or I'm, no, I'm not good enough to be there. And I think we've all, we've all experienced that. that, that somehow people are here. I'm, I'm not saying that I do this, or my wife does this, but we're not the only ones here. I mean, there are people here that will, are, not, are not mature enough yet, don't understand Scripture, don't understand the spirit that we come from, and they're tearing people down. And I apologize for them. I cannot control what everyone does and what everyone says. And I don't want to. This is not a prison. I'm not the warden. And everybody's a snitch. We don't need that here. We have liberty in the Lord. The Bible says all things are lawful, but not all things are edifying. Yea or nay? I mean, not everything we do is good. But we're under grace, every single one of us. Galatians 6 and, and 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, and I say that loosely, restore such a one by beating him over the head, making him feel guilty, shaming them. Oh, wait a minute. It says something different. If a, if a brother, if a brother or a sister is overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, or lest you also be tested. I mean, how do you like that? Because how you judge. I mean, if you're hard on everybody around you, it's going to come back at you that way. You know that. Amen. It doesn't say you can't judge. It says how you judge. Because people say, don't judge. It says you can judge. But careful how you do it. Is it in a sp spirit of meekness? Is it trying to help a person? Or are you trying to tear them down? Are you with me? And so... So do this in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Messiah, Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in other. For every person shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary... In well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. In other words, we don't quit. Somebody say, we don't quit. And so as therefore, as we have therefore opportunity, verse 10, let us do good unto everyone and to all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And he says, you see how large a letter I've written to you? With my own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, lest, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of the Messiah. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the Torah, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glorify in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord, our Adonai, Yeshua the Messiah, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Messiah Yeshua there is neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, shalom, peace be on them, and mercy and upon the Israel of God. For henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Yeshua. Brethren, the grace of our Lord and Messiah Yeshua be with your spirit. Amen. In other words, that's the way we ought to treat each other. And remember what the Lord said. He said, They shall know you're my disciples. How do people know that we are followers of Yeshua? By the love we have for each other. Amen. How we treat each other. In other words, if somebody comes in here that doesn't know the Lord and is mistreated 
in any way, shape, or form by the so-called um, mature community we have here. You know, the more spiritual that, you know, because we've shown up for a number of years, so well, we're so spiritual now. So we judge people and we make them feel less than. That's not, I mean, that's not cool. That's not right. People don't want to come to congregations because they are judged. And they are made to feel bad. And they leave a congregation. Now, you can worship God by yourself. There's no question about that. But I'm here to tell you it's much more difficult to worship God by yourself than in a group setting. And if we ruin it for somebody to not come here and be by themselves, then, then we, I, I, should I say the blood is on our hands? I mean, the error is on our hands. We cause somebody to trip instead of being here with us and encouraging them to have a relationship with God, which we need encouragement. Because the adversary walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We get devoured much more easily when we're out there by ourselves. As a matter of fact, it says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves as some, some of the matter have, as some people have said, I don't, want to, I don't want a fellowship, I don't want to attend the congregation. And I wonder why they're saying that. Because it's so pleasant when they show up to a place, or it becomes very unpleasant. That other believers make that person feel, un, you know, feel unwanted, feel, feel like they're, they're, I mean, they're not good enough. I mean, imagine. And if you look for a place that's perfect, as soon as you walk in, it's no longer perfect. Because you're there. The only perfect one that's here is the Holy Spirit. And the only true Christian is Christ. Everyone else is a wannabe, and everyone else is practicing, and everybody's on their way. But a true follower, 100% certified kosher, is Yeshua. Everyone else is fighting the good fight of faith, trying to stay in the Lord, trying for the Holy Spirit to, to, to be near God, because when we're in Him, as I said earlier in John 17, it says that we are perfected by being one with God. And, and the adversary will use, will use his filthy mouth, and, and he will use other people to make sure we're separated from God. And we're separated from a group. Because I've noticed over the years, much more difficult to worship by yourself than in a group setting. Especially when we encourage each other. And I'm not saying this to accuse anybody. I'm just saying, for the most part, the people that are here, we love each other. We honor each other. We're happy to see each other. We greet each other. When we come in here, we're happy to see you. But there may be, even the best of us slip. Let's put it that way. Even the best of us occasionally cast a stone over here, you know, you know a little side shot, you know, a little, a little arrow this way and that way. I mean, some of us, some of us, um, have a few arrows that escape our, you know, our quiver. Thank you. But, I mean, and sin is a sticky business with God and how he dealt with it. Because, because if you're focused on your sin, you're not focused on God. Are you with me? I mean, if you take, if you, if, if you get nothing out of today's message, if you focus on your error and people and, and the adversary will make sure you focus on your error. If you're focused on error, you're not focused on God. And when you're not focused on God, you're not going forward. Because the Lord said, if your eye is single, your body will be filled with light. Somebody say, I need the presence of God all the time. That's what transforms us. That's how we go from glory to glory. By the anointing, by the Holy Spirit. And when we're out of the Spirit, and we're in the flesh... To be carnally minded is death. In other words, we can step into life and we can step into death anytime, anywhere, any place. We have a free will. Is that true? In other words, can I stop seeking God if I want? If I want to stop seeking God? If I want to stop fellowshipping? 
Can I stop? Yes, you can stop all you want to. Who's behind that? Because if you stop, um, last week we read Hebrews 9. Let's read Hebrews 10. See what it says there about the sin business and the sacrificial system. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For the Torah, the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, notice plural. In other words, every time you sin, you showed up with a sacrifice. It could also be very costly because God said, I don't want, I don't want, the, I don't want the lame animals. I don't want the sick animals. I want the best of your flock. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Now the best, in those days, wealth was flo- what you owned in flock. You know, sheep, uh, goats. That's how, that was your wealth. In other words, every time you sin, it was going to be costly. In other words, God made it costly. Because was he trying to encourage you to sin? Or was he encouraging you to stop sinning? In other words, it was going to cost you money every time you sinned. And you had to bring a prize animal and watch it die for free. You're thinking, I could have sold that. I could have fattened that thing up. We could have had a feast. We could have been eating for a month off that thing. It cost me big. It's kind of like when you break the law today, aren't there fines? If you break traffic laws, do they just say, pat you on the, you know? They write tickets. And they make you pay money. So when you break the law in the world, what happens? Te cuesta dinero. It costs you money. And some of these fines are huge. In other words, fines could be into the millions. I mean, they could... They could, they could break you if they want to, the people that keep the law and, and penalize you. They can put you in jail and take away even your ability to, to uh, make a living. I mean, and God set that up that way. I want, I want it to cost you. I want you to realize what, you know, what's going on here. So for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices, plural, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. And that was, what was God looking for? He was looking for people to come to him. And he was looking to make them perfect, because God is perfect. Does God want us to be like him? Is that an unreasonable request? God says, I'm holy, I want you to be holy. That shouldn't make you nervous. That should make you proud. My father is holy. No, my father's a drug addict. My father's a drunk. My father's a lazy bum. My father's a runaway father. I mean, would that make you proud? My father is, my father in heaven is holy. My father in heaven is amazing. And my father, your father who is in heaven, wants us to be like him. Some people say, I can't be like that. Baloney. We come from him. And, and he moved in with us with, through the Holy Spirit, and he's as close as our breath now. I mean, those that received him, the Bible says, gave you the power to become the sons of God. For then, verse 2, would they not have ceased to be offered. So if the, if the sacrifices which were offered year by year, if they worked they would have stopped being offered. In other words, they would have beaten sin. In other words, they couldn't beat sin with animal sacrifices. So God made a new covenant that you still can't beat sin. We're all still sinners. We're all short of the glory. You know, we'll never be like that. So God said another covenant that's a failure. Is that the attitude? Or would God make a new covenant that we would overcome sin? that we would be sinning less and less and less and less. 
I mean, would, th would that be an amazing covenant? Or do you enjoy sinning? No. I mean, I used to when I, when I didn't know the Lord. But now it, 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 like, it makes me sick. Does it make you sick to sin? To go against the Lord? It turns my stomach every time. And you know when you do it. Because either your conscience kicks in or the adversary is like right there going, mm hmm, gotcha. I got you again. And you're like, <laughs> you're right, he got me again. I'm a loser. I'll never be like I'll never be like the Lord. I don't deserve to be loved. I deserve to be punished. I don't deserve to go to the Mishkan. All those holy people are there. I'm not holy. I don't I, I need to be in a room. I need to shut the lights off, close the curtains, and and, and kill myself. <laughs> and some do. Yeah. Yeah. And some do. I mean, but that's where the devil wants to take you. So then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible, verse 4, that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body have you prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have had no pleasure. Why did God have no pleasure in the sacrificial system under the first covenant? Because it didn't stop them from sinning. In other words, what's the point? Every time I sin, I show up with a sacrifice, and I just keep doing it over and over. Is it, is it helping? Was he satisfied? No. He was looking for worshipers to keep worshiping, not to keep sinning. Are you with me? So then I said, then said I, verse 7, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written to me to do your will, O God. Above when he said sacrifice and offering and birth offerings and offerings for sin, you wouldest not, neither have had pleasure therein, which are offered by the Torah, by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sacrificed or sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua, the Messiah, once and for all. We are sanctified. Notice what it says. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Messiah Yeshua once and for all. Does that mean we stop sinning? No. Or does that mean that we now have a sacrifice that can be used or utilized over and over? And is the sacrifice of Yeshua, His blood, to keep sinning or to stop sinning? Amen? In other words, I don't want to be separated from God. I enjoy my oneness with God. And sin separates us from God. Every time I sin now, I thank Messiah Yeshua for dying for me and laying his blood down and laying his life down and shedding his blood so that I can continue. That I don't have to focus on what I've done wrong. That I don't have to receive accusations because accusations only work if you receive them. Yay or nay? If you do not receive them, if every time you hear an accusation, you think the blood of Yeshua, the sacrifice of Yeshua, and you neutralize that accusation, because what does it say about fiery darts? The shield of faith. In other words, my faith is in his sacrifice, in my relationship with him, so that when I get a fiery dart fired at me by even my own brothers and sisters, ooh, it's not going to have an effect on me because I have, I am sanctified by one sacrifice. It doesn't mean I've stopped sinning. It means I am able to continue worshiping God and being perfected by my worship of God, not my focus on what I've done wrong. Because if you focus on what you've done wrong, you'll never change. Because the power to change is inside of each and every one of us through the power of the Holy Spirit. When you're in the Spirit, you change. When you're out of the Spirit, you don't change. Yay or nay? We're transformed from glory to glory because of being in the presence of God. 
not because of our performance. Are you with me? So the covenant actually works if you understand how it works. But unfortunately, many of us still don't understand because we accuse ourselves. We receive accusations. I've seen many brothers and sisters walking around with like, like a, they lost their wallet. I'm no good. I'm no this. I'm not worthy. I don't deserve to be loved. I don't deserve to be treated well. I never get blessed. I mean, nothing goes right for me. And they have that kind of attitude. I mean, that's the kind of attitude the adversary loves. He loves us to be this way. And so we receive accusation and we give out accusations. Because if you don't receive them, you're certainly not going to bring... I mean, you're not gonna, if I'm not going to take accusations, do you think I'm going to give accusations? But like people, you have, a, you have a problem with the Mishkan? Take it up with the boss. This was his idea. I'm in sales. He's in management. I didn't start this place. This, is what, this was not my idea. This was his idea. Is it running perfect? No. Why? Because a bunch of imperfect people here, including the rabbi, including his wife. And if you think I'm perfect, keep thinking that. And when I don't act perfectly towards you, take it easy on me. You take it easy on me, I'll take it easy on you. I mean, I can pull rank on anybody here. Amen? I can pull rank. I've been here from the first meeting in 1991. I've, I, I've missed very few meetings over the years, okay? I've read the Bible backwards and forwards probably a hundred times if I read it once. I started reading it backwards because I read it forward so many times. That's when you know you read the Word so many times. I have a lot of the Bible memorized already, a lot of the Word of God. You've noticed that when I preach because I, I don't have any notes. I mean, I've hidden His Word in my heart like King David said that I may learn not to sin against them. But I've learned not how to not sin against them. It's not just the Word, it's the presence of God. That's what's freed me from sin, or from being a sinful person. I am sinning much less than I've sinned in my entire life. What's it doing for me? I've never been this blessed in my entire life. Because He rewards those that diligently seek Him. And the adversary knows us. And that's why it says, without faith... It's impossible to please him. Those that come to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them who continuously worship. Now, if you're thinking about your sin, are you worshiping God? If you're thinking about Michael's sin, if I think about your sin, am I worshiping God? How about you, Yvonne? you got a few things. I'm thinking about you all the time. Hey, 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 look at that deep eye. Man, uh, blowing the show far there. Like, he thinks he's somebody. I mean, I'm thinking about you. I can't get life out of you. I can only get life from him. I mean, I'll pray for you. Because when I pray for you, I'm in God. When I accuse you, I'm out of God. When I'm praying for you, when I'm, when I'm encouraging you, I'm in God. When I love on you, I'm in God. When I love God and I love you, I'm in God. And when I don't, I'm out of God. And when I'm out of God, I'm in trouble. So, I mean, if you enjoy being in trouble with your brothers and sisters, accuse. Receive accusation. But don't. Don't receive accusation. I mean, he laid his life down for each and every one of us by one sacrifice. Yay? Because... Did God know the temple was going to be destroyed? Did he prophesy that the temple would be destroyed? Where were the sacrifices made? At the temple. If there was going to be no temple, there was not going to be any more sacrifices. And you can't be a worshiper of God without a sacrifice. Not effectively, anyway. You try to worship God without a sacrifice, you'll be, you'll be out in five minutes. The devil will kick you out or your brothers and sisters will get to you. If the devil don't get to you, they will. And you'll be out of the presence of God. You'll stop worshiping God in a heartbeat. 
Now, when you stop worshiping God, you're in trouble. I'm in trouble. I must be a continuous worshiper of God. In other words, the, the, the sacrifice, the blood of Yeshua, has had to cover me continuously for every transgression so that I can keep my focus on God. And not my own sin or your sin. Are you with me? I mean, that's a huge deal when you understand that. When I understood that, I, I became like a full-time worshiper of God. And I stopped wasting my time with, you know, focus. And the devil would accuse me. It used to work very well. It used to work on me all the time. I lived in guilt and I lived in shame. And nobody knows you feel guilt and shame but you. Because you don't let on. You know, like, hey, how you doing? Oh, Shabbat Shalom. You could be dying on the inside. You could be filled really with guilt and shame. No one would know unless you said something. I mean, we, we suffer guilt and shame silently. I mean, most people don't, don't run around going, oh, I'm, uh, I'm so ashamed. I feel so guilty. Oh, Shabbat Shalom, how you doing? Guilty. <laughs> you don't hear people talk like that. But they can think that. And as a man thinks, I'm focused on everything I do wrong. And who does that? The accuser of the brethren who does it day and night. Continuously accusations. And it's very effective. I've seen it work in my own life and I've seen it work in brothers and sisters. Not worthy. I'm not worthy to be loved by God. I'm not worthy to give love and I'm not worthy to receive love. And without love, we die. Because God is love. And if you don't love, you don't know God. Are you with me? And then it all makes sense. Love your enemies. Do good to them that use you. It's like you don't want anything. You don't want sin from yourself or others to stop the worship of God. You don't want to let that happen in your life. You need, to, you need to discard every one of those things. In other words, you, 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 you're, you're like stubborn for God and you're going for God and everything else you're going to go like this. It's like the Lord told the devil, get thee behind me. Why did he tell him to get behind them? Because he was in his face. The devil will get in your face. And if the devil can run interference, you can't behold his face, the face of the Lord. And I want to be filled with the, the light of God and the presence of God. That's what's changed my life. That's what's changed my personality. That's what's taken me from glory to glory. That's what's made a difference in my life. I'm much more like him than I ever was. Not by my own power. Not by my own strength. Not by my own volition but by the power of God, by the anointing, by the Holy Spirit. I'm being made perfect in oneness with God. And no brother, no sister, no stranger, no voice of strangers, no demons, nothing can stop me from being a worshiper of God. In other words, I'm going, I'm going for God with reckless abandon. Does that make sense? And only you can stop you. No one else. Because the Lord said, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. What is it, Lord? Um, is it a combination lock? Is it a fingerprint? He said, no, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, loose shall be loosed. In other words, you have power to control what's coming at you. You're either going to lose God in your life or you're going to lose, you're going to lose, you're going to lose anyway, but you will lose the devil in your life. In other words, you're going to let him have influence over you or no influence over you. Yay or nay. Let's keep reading a little bit. Do we have a couple more minutes? We, we left off in verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua of Jesus once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this person or this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, one sacrifice for sins, chew on that a little bit. For how long? 
This one sacrifice is good for how long? Forever. For each Shabbat? No. Or forever? forever? Why do I need this sacrifice? Forever. Because I need to worship God forever. And I need him to pay for my sins so I don't have to focus on my sin. I don't have to be sin conscious as was under the first covenant. Are you with me? And I wish more people knew this. Because everybody, oh, I'm a new covenant believer. Totally sin conscious. Totally focused on everybody else. I mean, your old test, your old covenant, you don't even know it. I mean, have you seen brothers and sisters like that? You, have you had that problem yourself? I was sin conscious and I was focused on what you were doing wrong. How did it go for you? Not very well. Wherefore the Holy Spirit, verse 15, the Holy Ghost, also was a witness to us for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws, I will put my laws into their hearts. Now let me put God's laws in your Who's going to put laws? Who gave the law to Israel? Who did they sin against? Moses? God told them what to do. What happens when they didn't do what God told them? Is that sin? What happens when you don't do what God tells you? That's sin. That's your sin. Like God told us to keep the Shabbat. Had we not kept the Shabbat, we'd be in sin. God told us not to eat pork and shellfish, told us that we run around telling everybody, stop eating. No, we had to stop eating because he told us. What would happen if I continued eating what he said not to eat? It would have been my personal sin. I am responsible, you're responsible, because the new covenant says he will write. Not his traditions. He will write his laws in your hearts. What's your job? Show up with your heart. Be a worshiper of God. Because if you're a worshiper of God, you're in the presence of God. You're in communication with God. God can communicate with you. You can communicate with God. And God's got some instructions for you. Commandments. Laws. Can he tell you what to do or not do? Is he still God? Yes. Somebody say, Jesus is my head, but you do whatever you want to. He's not the head, he's the tail. You're the head. Somebody say, time to be led by the Holy Spirit. You mean that God's going God's gonna to tell me what to do, how to do it, and when to do it? So what's your sin? What's my sin? Whatever he tells you to do. Yea or nay? How do you find out what God's will is? You worship God and you get in his presence. My sheep hear my voice. Are you with me? So I will write, I will put my laws into their hearts, verse 16, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of, the, of, of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Yeshua, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another. Verse 24, here we go again. To provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. How many people say, I see the day approaching? We should be encouraging each other even more now. For if we, sin, if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. 
but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much more sore punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy who has trodden under the foot underfoot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and has done despite to the Spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days, in which after you were illuminated, you endure a great fight of afflictions. Pilate partly while you were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion on me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. God has made an awesome covenant that actually works. If you understand how it works. Somebody say, I understand how it works. The sacrificial system was set up so that I could think about God and not my sins. And it didn't work under the first covenant, but under the new covenant it does work. I don't have to think about my errors anymore. I do sin, I confess my sins, to him, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And it's very quick to confess to God and to be forgiven and to keep worshiping God. It's very easy. I don't have to take an animal from my flock. I don't have to go to the temple mount. I don't have to see the high priest. I don't have to watch him kill my animal. I don't have to do this day in and day out. I just confess to him, he's my sacrifice, he's my high priest, he's my reconciliation, he has sanctified me, and I no longer have to focus on my error. I focused on him who is without error. And we can go from glory to glory to glory. Somebody say amen. amen. Let's stand up and honor him, please. Awesome. My wife said, awesome. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can give the Lord a big hand. I mean, come on. Anybody excited about God? I see a lot of good stuff in the future for us. I don't see a lot of good stuff for the unbelievers, but I see a lot of good stuff for the believers. Amen? We shall, we shall mount up with wings as eagles. We shall run and not get tired. We shall grow up as calves of the stall with healing in his wings. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you. Thank you for Messiah Yeshua. Thank you for his sacrifice for us. That even though we were dead, we were guilty, we were ashamed. That the blood of Yeshua has wiped out all the guilt, all the shame. I no longer have to be, we no longer have to be sin conscious. We can now think about you, Lord, continuously. We can enter into your courts with thanksgiving and with praise. And we can encourage each other. Father God, give us a spirit of encouragement of exhortation that we don't only come here to feed ourselves, Lord. We come here to encourage brothers and sisters to keep on keeping on, to never give up, to not faint, to continue 
to encourage, to pray for, to restore each other in a spirit of meekness. Father God, we ask for your forgiveness when we were not so meek, when we did feel, make people feel guilty or ashamed. We ask your forgiveness for that, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are teaching us and giving us a spirit of meekness and lowliness. And we who are more spiritual, Lord, can exhort, can encourage, can bless each other, can pray for each other, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we no longer have to focus on our errors because of your sacrifice, because of what you've done for each and every one of us, Lord. Thank you for giving access to the throne of grace 24 hours a day, seven days a week, especially in our time of need. And Lord, I pray for myself and I pray for every brother and sister that we need you all the time. That we don't want to do anything without you, Lord. We wish to acknowledge you in all of our ways. And we wish to be led by your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you are our shepherd and we are your sheep. And lead us, Father God, as you promised, green pastures, still waters, as you restore each and every one of us. Father God, I thank you for the restoration in my life. I thank you for the restoration in Esther's life. And I thank you for every restoration that has happened in the Mishkan over the years, Lord. Not by power or might, but by your precious Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for raising up an army of worshipers, of God's seekers, who are diligent, who are men and women of faith, Lord. And Father God, thank you for making us one with you, Lord, and perfecting us. And thank you for making us one in mind and spirit in the Mishkan that we love each other and we honor each other and we see each other the way you see us, Lord, with potential. And Father God, thank you for this tremendous hope because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Thank you, Lord, for rewarding each and every one of us who continue to be diligent seekers of you, Lord. And Lord, send more people Send more brothers and more sisters. We wish to see them perfected. We wish to see them restored. We wish good things in their lives. And we ask this in the name above every name, the name Yeshua, HaMashiach, the world knows him as Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a big hand. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching on the internet. We're going to close in worship, and then we'll do the ironic benediction, and the pizza's here. What an awesome, awesome word. Such wisdom can only come from above.
And as Gabe dismisses us with ironic benediction, as always, we encourage you to stay, break bread with one another, fellowship uh, with one another, uh, exhort one another to love and good works. And, uh, and remember that we're going to be here uh, next Friday night at 7.30 p.m. We hope that you will join us. Uh, thank you to every single person that supports the Mishkan, um, whether with your tithes and love offerings or with efforts that you put into helping uh, keep the Mishkan nice, all of these little things, every little thing matters. And so we thank you so much. We know you don't do it for us, but that you do it out of obedience. Thank you for your obedience. So many of us are blessed by it. God bless you all. We want to wish you Shavuot Nehedav. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. God bless you and Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, honey. We're going to close what is known as the Aaronic Benediction, found in the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. First in Hebrew, then in English. Pray for my voice. I'm voiced out. <laughs> Yair Adonai Panavalecha Vichunecha Ish Adonai Panavalecha Vyasem Lecha Shalom The Lord Yeshua bless you and keep you. The Lord Yeshua make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord Yeshua lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Bashem Yeshua in the name of Yeshua the Sar Shalom the Prince of Peace. Amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord a big hand. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching on the internet. Please stay and have some food. Adonai, Adonai.